Yeah. So once, once this is done, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of editing and then I'll send you the raw footage. I'll send you this whole file. Um, I like to upload it to drive and then just send it over just because it's a big file. It can be, you know, right. four yeah. gigs at a time. Um, and then once the uh, individual clips are done, um, you know, if, if you need, you know, consent, if you want to look over them before I post them, uh, that's hundred percent. Okay. And uh, I'll go ahead and make you collaborator on those posts. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Okay, great. Well, Caleb, uh, thanks so much for meeting with me. I'm glad we could finally do this. Uh, we had a couple of delays in the process, but um, how's everything going? Uh, you said you're, you're, you're in Kansas City right now, right? Kansas City, yeah. Everything's going well. Um, season's going well. Getting ready to start like our summer hours are a little bit different than like our spring or fall hours, even winter, I guess. With kids being out of school, we offer a little bit more in the morning, a little bit um, less in the afternoon, but it's, it's kind of shifts a little bit in time, but it's going well. Um, we should have a we should have a pretty good summer to be honest. So we're excited. Right, and and you're and you're transitioning away from baseball season. So right now, baseball season is for the high school kids. is mm -hmm. kind of like in full swing. A lot of them are getting ready for either regionals, like in this next week, and then hopefully late into the state run um, on the Kansas and then on the Missouri side as well. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, once these next couple weeks end, I think they have a little bit of a break before they start their summer ball officially. And then they don't really get, in terms of like a break, they go from playing state in, in, in high school right into kind of like the swing of things for summer ball. I think it's maybe a couple days, a week at that, and then they're kind of right like in the thick of it. And for a lot of these kids, like 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 the like the club ball is kind of where they make um where they make their bread. Um, they're traveling a lot. They're they're playing multiple games. They're going on the weekends on these blue chip tournaments. So it's it's it, it's hectic. It's busy. So we're hoping to, to transition and then hopefully get some of those guys back in to train that haven't been able to just because of their lengthy practice times and, and, and game schedules for their school. Got it. And so are these high school players, are they are they playing baseball year round or do they kind of, you know, have a transitionary period where, you know, in the summer they might be doing, you know, they might be doing summer ball. They might be traveling a lot, but they're kind of getting ready for another sport. So is that the case or are, are, are the guys that you work with specifically, are, are they playing baseball year round? So they are playing baseball year round. I would say they have a break. So once they start their summer ball, they have a break um, kind of towards late summer, kind of early fall, I believe, where they can kind of kind of cool off and kind of almost like start their off season until they have to kind of do more workouts for their school. So in like that, I would say August, September, up to like December, even kind of in January is kind of like like the bulk of like their off season. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're kind of like because we're a baseball facility, we see our numbers the highest. So in that in that kind of like early fall into the winter time period where we're pretty busy with high school baseball players specifically got it got it that's awesome man and um and, and does your does your facility mainly work with athletes who are a little bit more kind of um swing focused athletes like baseball players golf um you know like tennis that kind of stuff or do you guys sort of service a wide range of sports is it not intensive to only to only one sport Correct. I think it's 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 for sure all sport. We call it all sport for for that specific reason. Right. I think just uh, like the nature of it is that we have a baseball academy and a softball academy, so we were able to pull a lot more of those athletes in. Mm -hmm. So if we were to walk into a training on any given day, especially during like that fall period, like I was talking about, it could be 60, 70 percent, you know, rotation athletes with baseball, softball, even like a little bit of golf, tennis as well. But we have um, we also partner with a, with a volleyball academy, so we have a, a good number of volleyball athletes in there as well. Um, but we have soccer, we have wrestling sprinkled in as well. We have um, high school football players that come in during their off season. Um, pretty much any, any any sport you can you can think of, we can we can offer some benefit for. But like you said, just having those academies being able to pull directly from them, I think obviously makes it a little bit more. Um, Geared toward toward that in a sense, I guess, if you're talking about numbers specifically. Right. Got it. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, and um, and and did you start off? Uh, obviously, we were talking over the phone previously. So you started off as not a baseball. You started off as a soccer player, right? I did. I did. I okay. played soccer pretty much my whole life. You know, growing up, um, playing like those little rec leagues, like when you're five and six years old. Then going up playing competitive, traveling tournaments, teams. Um, 
it got pretty serious once I moved here to Missouri when I was 15, 16 in, in 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, played all the way through, and then I was able to play a little bit in, in, in college, and then um, I had to stop with a couple injuries. Um, but then I was even able to coach afterwards. So yeah, I grew up loving it. It's like my favorite sport for sure. Got it. And so you've been in you've been in Kansas City ever since. Ever since 2010, um, moved around, you know, suburbs and the like. But um, I've been in Kansas City ever since. Got it. Okay, that's awesome. And um, w- and where were you traveling to usually? Uh, you you said you would travel for soccer and whatnot. So would you travel to you know, a little bit, would you travel, you know, out East and out West or w- was it kind of a little bit more regional kind of like, you know, Missouri, Kansas area, or, you know, where would you usually travel? Yeah, we had, um, so we, we would, I would say like a bulk of our traveling took place in like the Midwest region. Mm-hmm. So we'd go parts of Missouri, we'd go parts of Kansas. We'd even go a little bit like Oklahoma, like Arkansas, um, Kentucky, even a little bit. And then some of like our bigger tournaments, we'd go, um, North Carolina, South Carolina, we'd go to Florida, we'd go a little bit in Texas, even sometimes those are like, kind of like the, like the big blue chip tournaments that like we would go to. Yeah. That's probably like 65, 70 of the time we're making like little four or five hour drives to like these, you know, more regional tournaments and then sprinkled in like two three times a year, we'd have like a big, big tournament where we're traveling, you know, obviously like, like by plane, uh, sometimes by bus to be honest too if it was if it was feasible um mm-hmm. but out like you know somewhere more like like southeast or somewhere more like south like texas got it okay damn what, what what's it like playing in texas because texas correct me if you think i'm wrong but you know texas is like is like the the big mamba when it comes to sports it doesn't matter what it is like they have insane football down there obviously you know like they take their high school sports really seriously um football basketball lacrosse lacrosse is growing a lot down there soccer obviously um so w- w- what was it like playing in texas of all places oh yeah i mean it was the, yeah like you said i mean they got they got like the um, best fields they got like the best facilities the teams are always good um it's 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 interesting you know being able to see like the styles of play that are kind of that kind of differentiate between like region um i just remember the teams from texas always being really big like really big and like really physical mm-hmm. Sometimes some of the other teams that were maybe a little bit more kind of like um, speedy, like, West Coast, like yeah, West Coast a little bit um, more technical, maybe a little bit like more speed reliant. But I just remember the teams from Texas just being big, just like just like some big dudes playing. Yeah. Um, so it was it was always interesting to kind of see that dynamic play out. Got it. Yeah, yeah, they got they got some big kids down there in Texas. Um, they they they're you know eating eating Southern food all the time, you know, yeah. cooking. Uh, that's what's getting them big, you know. Um, I actually uh, – I, I played um, football, basketball, and lacrosse in high school. And uh, for football, I did uh, a camp in Southern California for USA football and then traveled down to Texas to try out for the U.S. national team for um, – I think this was U17 at the time. Um, I was a sophomore in high school. Yeah, I think it was U17. Um, and yeah, to, to your point, I mean, I, I don't know what, I don't know what they're doing down there, but they, they got it figured out. Like there's a reason why they're so good at every sport. Um, doesn't matter if it's football, like obviously you have a lot of carryover from football into other sports with the size component and the, uh, you know, the power and the strength component as well, but to, just every sport is big down there. So it's, it's, it's crazy to see. Um, and, and what's kind of like within that same like mindset or within that same frame, like what's what's Kansas City like? Is it is it also a big high school athletic community or is it a little bit more low key? And that's more of a, a, a project for you and for your group. I think I think speaking um, speaking for baseball, I think it's a huge hub and even for soccer as well. And I would say, honestly, if you're looking at like the success rate between what we have for the men and the women, I think the women even do slightly better in terms of like getting these players to go to like these huge, you know, high division one powerhouse schools like Duke, Kentucky, North Carolina, um, Syracuse, like these powerhouse schools. Now the men are doing better as well. They're slowly growing. I think Kansas City is getting like a pretty good, pretty good recognition, honestly, for soccer and then for baseball as well. But I mean, you can, you can pretty much pick up any sport that you want over here. Cause I think it has a decent following. Um, basketball is growing like crazy. Um, we're hosting like all of these um, EYBL tournaments at like our high V arena, which is like somewhat close to like where we're at facility wise. So the goal is just to get more and more, you know, foot traffic in so we can kind of help these athletes out. Um, but I would say yeah, baseball, soccer, um, 
basketball, football is going to be key, going to be huge anywhere. Um, just with all the schools that we have over here. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say, I would say those four probably are like the biggest. Got it. Okay. And, and, and you said soccer fits in that framework as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Soccer. Definitely. Yeah. I think like with anything, like it's just growing, um, people are taking more of an interest to it. Kids are starting out earlier. Um, so I think it's just going to continue to grow. Got it. Okay. And, and did you go to high school in Kansas city or uh, was that, um, was Kansas city a, a, a post-graduation opportunity for you? Yeah. So I, I did high school one year in Texas and in, in El Paso, Texas, and then I moved wow. to Kansas city when I was a sophomore. So I went on the Missouri side. I went to Lee Summit West high school. Got it. On the Missouri side, not the Kansas side. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Missouri side. Yeah. Wow. Um, it was, one of the, it's, there's three high schools in Missouri. There's, the original Lee Summit, then they developed north, then they developed west, I believe, in 2004. So it was it was fairly, fairly, fairly new whenever I got there. Got it. And those must be big high schools as well. I mean, if, if there's if there's three main and correct me if I'm wrong, but if there if there's three main ones, you know, wh whether it's for soccer, whether it's for, you know, any sport in a state as big as Missouri and that services as many athletes as uh, Missouri, then those got to be big schools, right? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are pretty good size. I think. Um, I think that my graduating class was, it wasn't, it wasn't crazy, crazy big. I think it was about 350, like, like right under four. Um, okay. but I think obviously as the years go on, you kind of get more and more kids in like that district. Plus they're always, you know, having to redraw the lines as they're developing new property. And, and I think there's a talk of getting like another high school in there, but from what I've heard from my, from my siblings and from other kids that I've worked with is that the school now is it's gotten crazy in size where the graduating classes now are close to five, 50, 600 kids. Right. So it's just insane. So, I mean, it's just, you know, growing constantly, the area is growing like crazy. So it's, it's good. That's awesome. And, and what was the particular uh, draw for you? I know you said you, you spent one, one year in El Paso and then, and then you moved to Kansas city. So what, what was, what was the draw soccer and was the draw the kind of athletic community that was in Kansas city or was it, you know, was it, family related or you know what, what what kind of brought you to Kansas City yeah so my dad um used to work he's retired now but he used to work for Olive Garden so um he was a he was a GM and then he got a promotion that you know just couldn't really pass up to be a director for an area so regionally um so it was just kind of like he had been working obviously hard and then he got an opportunity and then it was one of those opportunities where you either take it or you don't. And if you don't, you might not get another one. So it was just a, a you know, a big, big step in his career. And so we were, we were fortunate enough to be able to move. And all of our family is based out of um, Texas, pretty much, whether that be Dallas, Fort Worth, El Paso from my dad's side. So we were the only ones for a while outside. Um, so it was, it was interesting for, for a little bit, kind of eye opening, like that big change, like that, like that dynamic change, I guess, going from, you know, West Texas to, you know, at least on the Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri. Got it. And, and was there a particular draw when it came to, to soccer as well, like you wanted to be in, in Kansas City or was it a little bit more reactionary kind of, you know, you, you were already planning on moving there. So you kind of had to, you know, plan everything else out and figure everything else out. Was it was it was the draw? Was that part of it or was the draw also soccer as well? Um, I would say that probably came secondarily, I would say, because at that time I was able to play because I played football ran track, did all that other stuff, like a middle school. And then and when I got to high school, we had a, we had a pretty decent um, team um, for my high school year. So I had played football because at that time in Texas, soccer was more of like a in-between, like like winter sport almost. Mm -hmm. So you could play at the same time that you play almost basketball. So theoretically, you could play football and then transition quickly into soccer in Texas, at least like in, like in West Texas. But then when I got to Missouri, football and soccer are both played at the same time in the fall. So I kind of had to pick. And so I'm not crazy big. I'm like five, seven. So it was, and then the guys here are obviously like bigger. So it was a little bit eye opening, you know, going through like those, you know, scout team offense versus the first team defense and vice versa. And, and dudes are big. So I had to kind of make that, make that choice pretty quick. Like my first couple of weeks here, whether I wanted to play football, you know, and get, and get, and get my body beat up or transition over to soccer. So yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty easy, but that was more probably secondarily, but um going into it, I didn't realize how big soccer was here in Kansas City, which is huge. It's huge. I think it has a huge following, um, but it was probably secondarily to the, the reaction of just having to move, you know, move states when you're 15 years old. Right. Got it. And um, and, and obviously, uh, and, and you said you played in college as well, right? Yes. 
Yeah, I played uh, I played a year, two years at uh, at a JUCO here in Kansas City, and then I played a year out in um, Illinois at a, at a D three private school um, for for a year, and then came back and finished up at UMKC. Got it. What what was the school in Illinois called? Uh, it was Greenville University. It's pretty much like forty five minutes past um, past St. Louis, like super 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 small town. I think it had a population of like a little over like five grand, but a lot of that I think accumulated from like the prison that they counted in like the census or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was like one middle school, one elementary school, one high school, and then like the college. Um, so it was like a super, super small town. Like if you drove, you could go through the entire town in like, I don't know, like five, six minutes, just going through like, you know, little back service roads. Um, easy to miss, but it was, it was nice. I liked it. The community was small, but it was like kind of tight knit. Got it. That's awesome, man. And um, what what was your experience like, you know, playing college soccer, going from junior college to, you know, playing D3? Was there, you know, just in general, like how was your experience and, and was there a big turnover between playing junior college and playing D3 or the, are the competition levels relatively the same or, you know, what, what, what would you report? I would say we had we had some pretty, pretty good competition. Um, here, here, local for our, for or not even local, but I guess regional for like our junior college year. Mm -hmm. um, I would say on a whole, the competition might have been slightly better, depending on like the teams that you played for my junior college. Mm -hmm. But then if you pick the outliers for for the D three school, I would play Wheaton. I would play like Walsh U, which those are like powerhouse schools. So I would say like yeah. like 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 the disparity was was a lot larger in like the in like the D three. And then we would even scrimmage um, division two schools out there as well. Um, so if you look at like the top, top schools or the top competition for the D3 school, they were like head and shoulders above what I would play at like my JUCO. But I think if you, if you, you know, JUCO didn't have like those crazy big dips, like, like the uh, D3 school had where the D3 school, I would, you know, you're playing Wheaton, you're, you're, you're playing Walsh U, then maybe next week you're, you're playing some smaller program that, is in its first or second year. So the, you know, the team isn't there just yet. So it was, it was a little bit more peaks and valleys where the JUCO was a little bit more level. Mm -hmm. Got it. And and what was the transition like going from uh, playing sports in high school to playing in college? Did you, did you know that you wanted to wear available, make uh, playing soccer more of a, a, a career opportunity or were, were you mainly focused on, getting the experience, interacting with athletes, having that experience and then moving on? Or what, what was kind of your focus going into college soccer? Yeah, I mean, I think I think I knew kind of early on that my chances of, you know, making a pro were obviously limited. Um, that was always the, you know, the dream growing up as a kid. But I think you, you realize early on and you kind of, you know, self-assess and you're able to understand that this is the path to, to make it to, to professional and and this is what I need to do, but also understand that it's look, you know, you're looking at like the 0.1% or like the 0.1%. So mm -hmm. I think, I think the goal at that point was just to go to school, to continue to play the game that I love as long as I can, if other opportunities were to arise from that for sure, but not to put so much emphasis on going just to like make it pro, but to go to help pay for my education, to go to help build relationships. And then, yeah, like I said, just continue to play the game for as long as I could. Got it. And, and so, uh, and along, you, you know, you were talking about opening up opportunities. I mean, obviously um, you could probably, I guess, put training in that, in that, uh, and being a coach in that kind of realm as well. So how did, how did that lead into coaching? Yeah. So once I got back from that, from that school out in Illinois and I had helped out during the summer or whatnot, whenever I was at JUCO, um, mm -hmm. but I got offered a job um, to help coach my high school team. Now they had at that time, they had three teams, but this with the influx of kids, they had wanted to make a fourth team the way, you know, they didn't have to cut, you know, 35, 40 kids from the front from the program. Cause it's, it's hard. You never know how a player is going to develop or like, you know, progress over the next two, three years. There's been a number of players that we've had that have contributed on the varsity level that were on the freshman team, you know, or on the C or like the, um, you know, lower level teams early in their career. And they just kind of progress up. So the goal is to retain as many athletes as we can, especially young athletes. Um, so they offered me like that second C team job pretty much to kind of help transition those kids that were on the lower level, but just transition them, prepare them for either the, um, like the first team C level or JV, and then hopefully even eventually varsity. Now, a lot of the kids probably won't, um, but it's just about giving them an opportunity and allowing them to develop as best we can, giving them a year, two years to develop and to see where they're at. 
Got it. Okay. And, and so, um, and, and was that immediately, was that, uh, were you coaching, um, for skill or were you coaching for, you know, athlete performance at that time? That time was just all skill. Cause it was just from a high school. Got it. Okay. And, uh, and how long did you do that for? And, uh, and are you, are you still doing that or, you, or have you kind of, no, no, just, yeah, just because of the schedule that, that I have at home field, it's, it's evenings. I'm sure you, you probably work similar hours, but it's, it's pretty much like three to eight, three to nine is like, is like when we're like in the bulk of our training. Um, so it's just, it wouldn't really work with like after school practices and traveling for games, but I did it. I helped out as like a, just like a um, summertime coach for, I want to say like two, two, two years maybe. And then I was a full-time coach for like the next four. And I still technically do help out in the, um, in, in the summer times with like early morning workouts when I can, that doesn't, you know, affect like my home field hours. Right. Got it. And so, and so, um, uh, and so how many hours a week do you do at home field? So we have 25 hours that we are contracted to, to, to be there and, and to train. Mm -hmm. Now those 25 hours entail just strict coaching for all of our other like group classes, uh, team classes, um, performance training. And then outside of that, you can add in one-on-ones because right now our training, I would say my training is, like 65 percent group training team performance which is the goal and then the other 35 30 percent would be like one-on-one -on -one training so i have about eight seven or eight clients that i train some you know one two times per week and then some up to you know four or five times a week so that that takes up a, a good chunk of like my morning afternoon even sometimes late evening times but those evening times from three to nine we are we are heavy with just athletic training for for our kids elementary, middle, high school, and then even like some college teams that we have sprinkled in. Mm, got it. And so how did that get started for you? I mean, how did, how did you transition from being, you know, more of a skill, um, you know, I guess, position specific coach in soccer to being uh, a strength coach into, you know, training athletes for performance? How did that get started? Yeah. So I think um, like, like we talked about before, going through all those injuries that I had and there was a time where I did kind of want to be a, a, a coach kind of full time. Um, but then understanding again, like the process and, and, and the road and understanding like all the rings I would have to jump through and just to get to like that top, top level, um, just the time. And then like the relocation aspect of it as well, because, you know, those coaches are bouncing around school here for a year, then over here for two years and moving back over here. It just, it seemed like a lot. And, and I was already a little bit behind in terms of like my, I would have to get new credentials. I would have to get new certifications and go through that whole process. Um, at that point, I was I was still in undergrad for for for, for PT because PT you know was also the goal of mine. And then going through um, my own rehab and then going through internships, I was able to kind of get my eyes opened up to really what it is that they do and how much of the time they spend specifically on athletes, which I loved. I loved working with athletes. I loved like that return to play protocol. I loved that that transitionary period for kids who were cleared technically by their by their physician, but don't really have any any direction or any guideline to follow to kind of help prep them back to their to their return to um, play. So, seeing that there was a gap and seeing that there was like an issue that needed to be addressed, I focused pretty much all my time and attention on on being able to help fill that gap. And there's really only one thing that you can do in that in that in that gap is just to help train performance because that's pretty much what it is. Um, so I, I changed my schedule around a little bit for my for my workload, and then I changed from what was like biology to um, exercise science. And then I I started just learning more, doing more research, applying out, ended up getting a couple um couple job opportunities, another internship. Then I turned that into a into a into a full time gig at home field. That's awesome. And so you you said you switched majors from bio to exercise science. Yes, I was uh, I was um, undergrad. I was biology for like two and a half years, and then I was able to do exercise science, which wasn't like drastically different. I had to do a lot more, obviously, like anatomy, physiology classes, exercise science classes. Mm -hmm. um, but I had pretty much all of, like my prereqs that, that that I needed done. I think it was like an extra, I don't know, like 12, 15 credits that like I had to get on top of what I already had. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't anything like drastic, drastic. Because I mean, you know, they're similar, similar course loads and similar kind of prereqs have to check off. Um, but yeah, I mean, it took like I think an extra, took like an extra like couple semesters, so it wasn't anything like crazy. Mm, got it. Okay. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I actually didn't know um, that you were uh, previously wanting to be a PT and kind of moved uh, or that you were previously doing bio. And then you kind of moved to exercise science, wanting to be a PT. And now you're a little bit more uh, performance focused. I think that's what a lot of um, and correct me if you think I'm wrong. That's what a lot of physios kind of like to do. They like to, um, you know, they might start off doing one thing and then they might become a PT, but they're not just wanting to limit themselves to um, injury restoration. They want to actually help athletes prevent injury. And a lot of that kind of drive and that motivation is based on, you know, their own experiences. It was certainly the same for me because I, I'm similar to you. I was, I was, um, I was getting injured a lot and, uh, I wanted to find ways to, to improve my performance and to help others do the same without, uh, you know, in, in, you know, with, 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 um, with foresight, you know, being proactive about it, you know, how do I heal these current injuries, but also prevent, you know, future injuries to the same area and also, um, unrelated injuries. So I was, I was, a, I guess a, a similar route. Um, <clears throat> so how did you kind of, uh, and are you still a PT or are you, uh, just a athlete performance coach at this point? Yeah, yeah, no. So no, yeah. So um, just uh, regular strength and conditioning coach. Got my CSCS. Mm -hmm. um, I should have my master's in kinesiology by the spring of, of of next year. But yeah, right now I'm just full into performance training right now. Got it. Congratulations, early congratulations, man. Pretty that good. must be a that must be a long a long process. Um, you know, obviously to go from starting out in bio and then you know all the way to you know getting a grad degree in um and exercise science and, you know, kinesiology, that must've been, uh, must've been a process. Yeah, no, I mean, like it's, you know, it's, it's been good though. It's, you know, it's what you love. It's, it's, it's why you're doing what you're doing. So yeah, it's been good. Um, you know, long nights, early morning sometimes, but I'm sure you're, you're, you're not accustomed or you're accustomed to the same thing. So it's just, you know, part of the, part of the business, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's definitely all part of the business with uh, being a coach and with performance training. Um, yeah. A lot of early mornings and a lot of late nights. That's kind of, that's what a lot of people either realize or might not realize going into this gig. Um, a lot of people that uh, I've worked with in the past or also wanting to be coaches, um, you know, for them, like they, they still don't understand, like, you know, when you're training athletes, you know, if you're trying to service a particular population or if you're trying to, you know, help everybody that that comes to you, you have to have these kind of hours in many cases. Right. Um, and you might not have the same hours every single day. You know, you might have a schedule where you go Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, give the athletes Wednesday off. And, you know, there's there's a lot of variability there, but you kind of have to be ready for that variability if you're going to be in this business. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, it's. Yeah, we are we are doing our best to like service athletes. And so we have to make sure that our our training, you know, does that. And I think that's 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 the biggest thing that like that we try to focus on is understanding that these kids are are here for, you know, two, three, four, four or five hours, sometimes like at the most, you know, and they're spending obviously like the rest of their day somewhere else. We don't we don't have full control over over what they're doing, over what they're putting their bodies, over over what they're doing at like their skill work, over what they're doing at practice. So we don't that's I think that's the toughest, toughest thing sometimes is to understand that like we don't have complete control. And even even at like the college level, even though you're 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 seeing the same kids over time, you still don't have complete control over over what they're over what they're doing. And so you can say certain certain days, you can take certain intensities, but at the end of the day, we're, like, we're having to modify on the fly a little bit to, to kind of help these athletes and prepare them because the, the, like, the end goal should be getting them to their sport healthy and, and feeling well. Now, there's certain adaptations, obviously, that, that, that we can take that'll, that'll kind of put bumps and bruises on them along the way. But the goal isn't just to beat them down to the ground, it's to prepare them. And there, there are days that are going to be harder than, than not. But I think like the biggest misconception is that kids have to leave, you know, leave the weight room or like, or like leave our facility, just totally drenched in sweat, exhausted. Cause if you do that consistently, they're not gonna be able to play their sport. And I think yeah. that's kind of like the pull that like we have with these parents sometimes where, you know, they're saying I'm paying all this money and I, I need you guys to like kick our son's butt. And I'm like, well, your son just played, you know, four games this weekend. So maybe, maybe that isn't the goal. It shouldn't be the goal right now. Just, you know, get his body right with, with, with movement, which can look different for everyone. So it's about adapting on the fly, which I'm sure that you're, custom to um let me ask you real quick what is your like training philosophy i guess if you could break it down 
um, in terms of like what you believe in, in terms of how you approach it. I've seen a lot of your videos. Obviously, I, I agree with a lot of what you say, and I, I kind of love those breakdowns. But give me like a little tidbit, if you could. Right. So when it comes to training my athletes, I mean, it largely depends on the population that I'm working with. If I'm working with uh, football players, I work with a lot of baseball players just because uh, our facility uh, or at least the main facility that I work at, which is in um, Doral, Florida, uh, it's half strength and conditioning, half athlete training. <clears throat> and then the other half is a facility called I am baseball, which basically just trains baseball players constantly they always have guys rotating inward and outward um high school guys college guys pro level guys um and you know no matter who i'm servicing i kind of have uh, a number of central tenants that i like to focus on for all of my athletes in terms of um you know th their off season and how we plan their off season um it usually uh i guess the main tenants would um revolve around uh training uh, for different categories of force at different velocities. So um, that would kind of be the strength, power, and speed component. Um, you know, how do we get our athletes producing um, as maximally as possible for, uh, you know, within certain frames, like depending on what their sport is. If their alignment in football, we'd be a lot more strength and power focused, whereas they're, if they're, you know, um, a baseball player we do a lot of rotational power work uh, if they're a wide receiver or a soccer player or, you know whatever it may be then it'd be a lot more speed intensive um so we kind of molded you know based on their perspective you know goals and intended outcomes but um that's i guess the first tenant is kind of like the relationship between force and velocity you know what we want them producing um then there's capacity uh when it comes to um when it comes to force production, uh, you know, how can you, if you're a football player, how can you produce the most power and the most speed for the longest period of time? Cause you know, these games are long, they're grueling. Um, if you have a, a, a high school athlete playing football, who's, you know, playing both ways, they're playing, you know, 70, 80 plays a game. They're, they're exhausted. So how do you, how do you prime them for performance to where they can play an entire game and also an entire season that way? Um, and then you could also fit the cardiorespiratory component in there as well. Like how do we make sure that um, they have, that they're training the right energy systems, both in the off season and in season in order to perform their best. That largely depends on their sport. Um, then we also focus on uh, when it comes to movement, we focus a lot on coordination and um, you know, how do we uh, prime certain movement patterns to ultimately not just, you know, uh, develop them in a session, but also how we can, um, how they can perform optimally on the field. Um, however, we can do so without getting too sport specific and without like just having them play their sport, um, having to find ways around that. That's what we focus on a lot. Um, and then uh, I guess a, a, a last tenant, a last primary tenant could be, um, uh, mobility. And, um, you could also, I guess, in, in certain ways, pair that with coordination. Um, but if our athletes are not, uh, mobile and they're not, um, if, if they're not resistant to injury and we're not training for, um, both tissue and tendon quality within the framework of mobility and extensibility, then the chances that they're going to get injured are way higher. Um, right. so we're, we're, we're trying, we focus a lot on mobility. Um, even if it's not during our actual lifts or during our actual speed sessions, um, I always have guys coming after, after practice and after, uh, the lift saying like, Hey, what can I do to be more mobile? Um, and to, uh, you know, I've been having problems in this area. I'm having problems getting into certain positions. So can you help me with that? Um, so I guess those are the four main components are, um, you know, force and velocity, uh, capacity, coordination, and mobility. So I guess those are kind of the, the four tenants that I focus on with my athletes. Yeah. Sense. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. All, all sounds great. Uh, could you break down, and we got like less than a minute, could you break down kind of like what like a normal session would look like just real quick, like kind of like top to bottom from beginning to end? Yeah. Um, so we always start our athletes off with a dynamic warm-up, a dynamic prep. Um, then we move into our uh more session specific prep, whether it's power, whether it's um speed development, whatever it may be, agility. Um, we like to 